So the next thing we're going to want to add is going to be something like a hotbar where we can switch our different items out by uh, pressing on buttons that will appear at the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to right click on the canvas layer. This is where we'll just set up all the UI stuff and we'll add a child node. So let's start a new scene with file new scene, go to user interface, and we will set up our hotbar at the bottom of the screen. So we can right click on the control node, add a child node, and let's try a grid container again. So this grid container, I want it to show at the bottom middle. So let's go to layout and change layout mode from position to anchors and anchors preset to bottom middle, I think is what we want. Let's see center bottom. So that's where our buttons are going to show up now. So we can right click add a child node. So here we can try with a button. I'm not actually sure if we want texture button or button, but let's try normal buttons first. Okay, and we can set an icon here. So let's actually add in the copper axe icon or copper axe copper dot PNG. So we'll drag that in there and let's see. So yeah, okay, that should just work with a normal button. So we could duplicate this and add in let's say like a hammer button and duplicate that again and we'll add in a pickaxe button now uh, we want these to lay out horizontally so let's click on grid container and make the columns 10 which means that until we have 10 buttons it's not going to jump to a new line and then we need to add a script where uh, we can take the buttons and use it to equip a different item to the player based on which button we press Let's also take the grid container first and take its size and I'll make it 20 pixels or I guess it goes to 24 as a minimum. And then we can recenter it at the bottom. So center bottom, I guess we'll just manually move it down here. So as long as you get it to the bottom middle of the screen, that should be good enough for right now. Okay, I'm going to rename the control at the top. We'll call this uh, we'll call this hotbar. Let's save the hotbar scene into the UI folder. Then we'll attach a script to it hotbar.gd inherits from control that's fine and we'll save that as well okay next i want to take each of these buttons and i want to rename them to be item buttons because they're going to have a item attached to them so let's have item button one item button two item button three and let's attach a script to the item button so i'll right click and attach a script extends from button and in these we're going to have a item that is set to the button when the button is pressed we'll be able to set that item uh, to the player if it is a equipable item type so let's do export var item and i'm actually going to create another class which will just be item for the game uh, since we already have equipable item.gd but not every item you'd put on a hotbar would necessarily be equipable a lot of games would have consumable items like a healing potion or something so we can have a base class that all items build from all items that can be put on a hotbar at least so let's right click in resources and i'll do new script this will extend from resource and we'll just do item.gd and let's make sure that is out in items folder so now equipable item is actually going to extend from item we can pull this information display name and texture out to item.gd so class name item and then i'll paste that in display name and texture uh, because all items are going to have both of those and because when you extend a class you inherit all of its properties so a equipable item is going to have the display name and texture because it is a item so equipable item here extends item and then we don't need this because those are already defined now one thing i have noticed is that uh, when you kind of restructure your classes like this that sometimes the inspector doesn't automatically update um, for your classes and your and your existing resources so i'm just going to restart the editor so we can see how it displays here after it recognizes the item class so let's uh, go to project reload current project okay now extend items and go down to copper pickaxe okay and now you can see uh the fields are still there and they still have the same data but now this information is actually coming from item as a class not from uh, equipable item so we can still uh, actually write new fields in equipable item if we need to uh, just note that now these fields are coming from the item class okay now what that allows us to do is go into the item button and and we'll have an export var for the item in the slot here. So this is an item. And now it can take any type of item, not just an equipable item. 
And we're not going to need a ready or process function here. Let's make sure that all three of these item buttons have the uh, same script. Or really, let's take item button and right click and save it as a scene in our project. And UI, of course. So we'll save that there. Now we can just take these two item buttons. And now we'll duplicate the item button. And now all three of these buttons are inheriting from the scene, which is better because now we can jump into the scene to edit all three of them at the same time. Okay, let's just quickly set up the textures again. So under art, let's get the tools. So hammer can be there. And the third one of pickaxe is there. But what we really want to be having here is a setter function on our item where when we set that we also update the icon automatically and we can have that run in the editor using at tool annotation, uh, just like we did before. So I'm going to jump into the item script. Let's go up here to the top. I'm going to do at tool. So now code is going to run in the editor as well. And let's create a setter function. So new item, or we can call it item to slot. That's going to be a type item, obviously. So when we set the item to slot, we need to update the member field. So like that item equals item to slot. Okay, I guess we can't actually define that uh, type there. And there's really no need to because we know that when we're setting a value here, it's already an item. Okay, so what our button does have is a icon field. So we need to set that icon field to whatever the texture is from the new item. So icon equals item dot texture. Okay, and uh, that is probably all we need right there. Let's test it out. So an item button here. Let's go and get our items. So we have copper pickaxe and we have copper axe. So let's test with copper pickaxe here. I'm going to drop this into the item slot. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, for the tool script to actually work, you have to reload the editor first. So let's go to project, reload current project. Okay, now we'll click on the button. Let's get the item copper pickaxe and drop it in there. Okay, and you see the icon updates immediately. So the second one, we'll click over here. We'll just drop copper axe here. Cool, that's updating the icon as well. At, we'll create a copper hammer item as well to go along with that. So duplicate copper X, and I'm just gonna call this copper hammer dot T-R-E-S. So let's click on copper hammer, and then we'll rename this copper hammer. For the affected types right now, it doesn't have any. I'll just delete the affected types. So the hammer can't actually affect anything yet. And the texture, let's uh, load from the project and art gathers exterior tools and we have copper hammer okay so now uh that we have that item as a resource we can drag this into the item slot and the copper hammer is now showing up there uh next we want to connect our hotbar to the player uh so that the hotbar can access the currently equipped item on the player and change it when one of these item buttons are pressed so we set up a node group called player uh, specifically for the player character. So we can use that in order to find and access our node. So let's jump into the hotbar script. So we're going to have up here at the top um, at on ready var player is a, is of type player. And we're going to get that equal to uh, get tree dot get first node in group because there's only one player, single player game. And we're looking for the group player. And that should come back as a player node. Okay, so when we have the uh, player node, then we can pretty easily get the hand equip node as a child of the player, which is where we put the equipped item. So let's check on ready if uh, the player was actually found from on ready. And if that's the case, then we can do up here, var hand equip. I guess we can give it a class name too. So in hand equip, I'm gonna give it a class name, hand equip or no underscore hand equip. Now let's go back to the hotbar script. So our hand equip is of type hand equip. So if there's the player, then we're going to get the hand equipped under the player. So hand equip equals player dot find child. And we're looking for hand equip. So you can search by class name and you can also search by the name of the node. So once we have the hand equip, we just need to know which item is being changed out on the player and then we can set it up. So we don't need this process function here for sure. So next, when these item buttons are pressed, we need to have the item that they are storing uh, equipped to the player if the item is of a type equipable item. So taking a look at the signals here, the signal for pressed doesn't actually specify uh, which button was pressed, which is a little annoying. 
So I think as a workaround, what we'll do is we'll have the hotbar tell each of the buttons what the hand equip that's active on the hotbar is. And then each of those buttons can respond to their own signal. And we don't need to worry about which button was pressed because each button will respond to their own signal individually. So uh, we need to get access to those buttons. So let's do at unready var grid, con grid container, which is of type grid container. We're going to set that equal to grid container. So if we get the hand equip, then we're going to get all of these buttons under the grid container. So for button in, let's see, grid container dot get children. And then to easily see the field on those buttons and make sure that it's the right type of button, uh, let's go into the item button class and let's give this a class name as well. So class name item button. So now we can check down here if button is item button. And then we can do button dot item because we've already confirmed which class it is. So we have access to the fields. Oh, really, you would have access to them anyway. It's just that they'll show up as a hint now uh, that we're dealing with the class name. So button hand equip is equal to hand equip. So we'll need this field in the button as well. So we'll go into here. We'll have our hand equip of a type and equip, of course. And that's how we let each of the buttons know about the dependency hand equip when our script starts so that they know where to put the item and they also have the item to put. So now we just need to connect each of these buttons to their own signal. One way we could do that is with function underscore ready and we'll just connect the pressed signal to on pressed to a new function we're about to create on pressed. Okay, and uh, just to be consistent with naming schemes, underscore. Okay, let's create that function now. Function on pressed, underscore on pressed. So the first thing we're gonna to want to check is if the item is a equipable item. So if item is equipable item, then we also wanna check if the hand equip is valid. If hand equip does not equal no, then we're gonna take the hand equip and we're gonna set the item that's equipped to the item. So hand equip dot equipped item equals item. Uh, and uh, I renamed equipable item to have only one P. So that should fix that up. Okay, so our buttons will now do respond to their own signals and we can put the item in the hand equip slot. The hotbar will take care of finding the player and finding the hand equip slot. Um, reason to do it like this rather than on each button is you might have 10 buttons, but just finding the player once and telling the different buttons about where the player is or where the hand equip is, is just a bit more efficient way of doing things. So let's go back to our game level scene, 2D view, and let's put the, um, hop bar under the canvas layer. So hop bar in the file system, drag the scene here. Okay. We can see it down there in our UI. Let's hit play and we have our hotbar down here. Let's test it. So I'll click here and we change our equipped item. Click here for the hammer, here for the pickaxe. And just like that, we have a hotbar, which will work for switching out tools. So if we switch to the, the pickaxe, we can harvest this node and get all of that stone. But if I switch to the hammer, you can see this tool doesn't actually work for that. And neither does the ax yet. Oh, but the ax might be able to harvest the tree now. Okay, there we go. Yeah, we're harvesting the tree. Got all of that wood. And of course, you'll notice here that when we're harvesting these trees, we don't have to use the swing animation yet. So we'll set that up in a minute so that you only harvest during the swing animation. But you can see how our different tools are now harvesting different nodes, which is super cool. And we can just switch between our hotbar tools with just one button press. So one last thing before we wrap up with our item button script here. Since we're using the at tool annotation in order to make it so that we can set the item texture in the editor whenever we update the item, but adding at tool also means that other code may actually run in the editor as well. Now I'm not sure if at now I'm not totally sure if underscore ready or the callback on pressed are going to trigger in the editor, but we want to make sure that they don't, I think. So let's add the bit in to make sure that it will only run in the actual game, despite us having the at tool annotation. So if we do if engine dot is editor hint, 
then that means that the code that follows is going to run in the editor. So we want if not engine.isEditor hint. And uh, then on the next line, add the tab. So we save that. So this means basically any code that comes after here, we're going to skip when we're in the editor, but we are going to run in the game. And we want to put the same thing down here on pressed. So when you're using at tool, although it's cool to be able to run code in the editor, uh, you do have to be careful when you're combining um, it with your actual in-game code. So let's still make sure that the buttons still work. So if we go in-game, we can see that they do, but this should now prevent us from accidentally uh, pressing on the button and setting the hand equip to the player when we're just editing the game here, because that could kind of mess things up and we don't want that to actually trigger. So be careful with your at tool and then use these lines when you want to separate your editor code from your in-game code. One more thing for this little hotbar. Uh, let's move it off at the bottom of the screen by about five, 10 pixels, kind of like we did up here. So I'll close out here. Let's go into the hotbar scene and let's, um, we could add a margin container, which would work all right. Or we could just take the grid container and let's hit W to go into move mode and just move it up 10 pixels. I think that will basically achieve the same thing here. So I'll save, we hit play to go into game mode and now it's up there. Uh, but it scales everything by times four. I forgot about that. So let's actually move it to more like two or three pixels off the bottom. So moving it seven pixels down means it's three off the bottom. So times four is going to mean 12 pixels off the bottom of the screen. So that looks like a pretty good placement for our hotbar. And uh, that should pretty much be it for what we need the hotbar to do.